Welcome to the Swim Swam podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, I've got a very special guest. He's an SEC champion. He is a world champion. And, and now he is officially a swammer. Uh, please welcome Zane Waddell. Zane, how's it going, man? Hey, how's it going? Uh, good. Thank you for having me. get into this first we just we just talked about it a little but you know you announced your retirement pretty recently you said it was it was fine for financial reasons we've we've done quite a bit of reporting on on south africa swimming and in their financials and um you know i think it still took everyone by surprise because you you're a world champion year and a half ago um so so let's get into it you know tell me a little bit about what went into this decision uh both financially and just kind of for you personally yeah, so obviously it, it was a big decision to make. I had I spoke to all, um, my family back home and um, really just them and my support system here in the U.S. And because I mean they're really the only people that matter um, to me and what that means to them and everything. Um, but obviously it was a hugely a financial uh, decision. After World Champs, I was told that the fifty back isn't an Olympic event, so I'm not going to get funding. Um, even though I was the only gold medalist from the continent of, of the whole of Africa at world champs. Um, COVID-19 hit that brought a lot of struggle for businesses and for sport federations alike. I mean, I think everyone was hugely impacted by that. Um, but yeah, I just, you can't make ends meet with effort in the pool. That's uh, was a, a very brash realization that I, I came upon. Yeah. Uh- <laughs> I mean, and that makes sense. And that's, that's hard. And so you, you have a full-time job now. You got, you had two majors at Alabama, you said, you know, 3.8 GPA, you worked really hard on your academic side. Um, I mean, what, just describe a little bit about what that means to you to, to ha- have had that backup plan. And now you're kind of putting it into action. Yeah. It's, it's something that my parents, my mother, my dad drilled into me. You, you can't swim forever. What if you get a shoulder injury? What if, if you, you know, things are going to happen in life where you, that you're not prepared for, that you always have to have a plan B for. And uh, yeah, I worked hard at University of Alabama. I got a um, Bachelor of Science with, two, with uh, two majors, one in management information systems, one in finance, 3.8 GPA. Um, I used all the resources that Alabama made available to me. Um, and yeah, it's, it's all about working hard and making sure that you make yourself employable after swimming. I mean, swimming looks huge on your resume, but especially for me, something that was hard transitioning, um, especially in such a short time frame. I think I, I retired and then three weeks later, I was, I was interviewing. Uh, I had, uh, then I had the full-time job offer from, from the bank. Um, is that if you're swimming internationally, um, you're competing at, in meets during the summer, um, you don't have time for internships, getting that in-between semester experience, which which I found a little bit difficult. Um, but then having swimming on your resume as an NCAA athlete helps a lot because um, that shows that you're willing to put 20, at a minimum, 20 hours a week into your collegiate sport. Um, and that it displays that you have time management. You're definitely going to be one of the hardest workers in the office. So it was a little bit of an adjustment, but I found that I can focus my competitive energy into a different uh, faucet of life, which it, it's fun. I really enjoy the work I'm doing right now, um, mentally engaging. Um, and I'm, I'm still, I still get into a weight room every now and then if they stay open for the next <laughs> couple of weeks. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, it's, it's crazy times right now, certainly for, for working out. And I'm yeah, obviously, as you mentioned, the pandemic, I'm sure, didn't help the situation of trying to finagle, you know, how am I going to keep this career afloat? You know, one, one way a lot of athletes did find support was through the ISL, which you were signed up to do. You were on the LA, you were on the LA Current, um, and then take me through, you know, what happened in that situation. Yeah, so that was one in 10 million chance of possibility of things that that could have panned the way they did. Um, so I was signed up for the LA Current. I signed, I was ready to go. Um, I had my bags packed. Me and uh, Robert Howard was actually in Tuscaloosa 
and and we were training together or all, all the pros were kind of training together here and, and we'd um, be getting ready because you had to get the two COVID tests five days before your flight. So we did the COVID tests. But leading up into that, um, I had to get a Hungarian visa or a Schengen visa for the Schengen area because with my South African passport, um, I, you, you can't get into the Schengen area without a visa. I know with American athletes, it wasn't really a problem because um, – the Schengen area has a deal with the American passport. You can get in there without a visa. So I flew over to Washington, D.C., which was the, the closest embassy. I, I rented a car. I drove over to the embassy. I got all done. I got the, the visa approved and everything. And then they had to keep my passport to put the visa in it and then ship it back. And uh, the USPS lost the, my passport. So I didn't quite have a passport to leave the country or get back into the U.S. afterwards. Um, but I was in constant communication with the people at LA Current talking, okay, if I get my passport this week, I'll be able to take part in these meets. Mm-hmm. Originally, the hope was that USPS is maybe just running a week, two weeks late with their postage um, and that I'd be able to make it back for the playoffs. Um, but that ended up not happening. Um, it just happened to coincide with the, with the election um, and the whole postal system was just clogged with mail-in ballots um, and e- everything of the such. So my passport just got lost. It got lost in, in the flurry of COVID-19 elections and just everything going on. Yeah. That's, I, yeah, that's, that's, that's bad luck. That really yeah. sucks. Um, and so at that point, were you still, um, you know, af- after, after you realized you weren't going to make it to ISL, I mean, can you take me through the thought process of, well, am I going to try to continue swimming? You know, am I going to keep, keep trying to make this work? Um, Because, you know, we see a lot of people try to make those ends meet and sometimes they can, and sometimes they can't. What was the process like for you? Yeah. So immediately after that, I was like, okay, I've got to get some stuff in order. I need to start getting an income because, um, you get 20,000. And then of course you pay taxes on, on top of your prize money that you win at world. So I had to pay my, my fair share of tax on that 20,000. Um, so that was just starting to run out uh, because I mean, 20,000 d- d- doesn't go very far um, n- n- nowadays. And so I thought, you know what, I, I, I have to get a part-time job. Um, so I got one, but because of COVID-19, it was a very client facing job. You had to work with people every day. Um, and then that eventually died down because people weren't as confident going out and facing people if it wasn't necessary. And um, so that just fell through. Um, and that part job, it just, it didn't really provide the amount of income that I needed. Um, so yeah, I, I was being stubborn. I was speaking to my people. I was like, you know what? I can make it work. I'm, I'm going to go down to my last dollar. And even if it means that I'm going to be broke in debt for this, but um thankfully because it's very hard to come back from that and um you know it's just it's one of those decisions you have to make you're not getting support from the corporate side you're not getting support from um, the sport federations which has been a problem for a long while i mean we had south african swimming legend roland swimming he's spoken out before that in, in in the past where he hasn't got funding um for 2019 i had to pay a portion of my way over to worlds um so it ju- just makes it difficult um, to try and make ends meet. And then, I don't know, asking for, fu- for funding off the world to kind of, and then saying it's not an Olympic event, we're not going to find you, it kind of invalidates my, uh, the amount of work I put into it to, you know, be a world champ. But yeah. at the end of the day, I try and look to the positive side of things. I now have a full-time job and starting to climb the corporate ladder. Um, it's, mentally cha- it's, it's mentally challenging work. And I ended it on a high, you know? um they have luckily i i'm very strict about the supplements i I hardly use supplements i drink water and gatorade but none of that was happened to be spiked and i had clean drug tests throughout and i finished the world champion so that's just the positive side that i try to look at um even though it is sad that you know the olympic dream is always there but nowadays a world championship olympics it's it's just kind of the same thing so yeah (laughs) absolutely um I mean, you know, you, you, you spoke about trying to make those ends meet. Um, you were being stubborn, which 
t- totally understandable. I mean, you know, it's like you're, you're chasing the Olympic dream. Um, do you, you know, when you spoke to your support system, what, what advice were they giving you or, or how are they trying to, you know, aid in what way they could? Yeah. So, I mean, coming from South Africa, it's tough. Uh, the currency value is lopsided and, um, it's, it's, if you think of South Africa, think about what opportunities you can get there. And then it, it, the pieces kind of fall together, uh, for my parents. Um, but something that's very important for me is, uh, I have to, I'm now getting into my early twenties. Um, it's time to start standing on my own two feet. I can't start relying on other people for support. Um, it's time to start, you know, building my life, building my savings, retirement accounts and all that. Um, just on to build my own financial base, because if you don't do that in your early twenties, you could really screw yourself up on the back half of, of your life. Um, but talking to them, they, they knew well, what it was. They knew my competitive nature. They knew I'm incredibly stubborn that, you know, this is something that I want to do. And from, if I want to do it, I'm going to do it. Mm. But they had to talk some sense into me, be like, listen, you know, if, if you have like six bucks in your bank account, there's no way you like, you, you can't do it. I was like, no, I can do it. Trust me. But yeah, I'm very appreciative with everything that um, the people around me have done. They're going to be around me for the rest of my lives, their lives. Um, I'm just really appreciative for that, but it's, it's always nice to have some sense spoken into you. It, it's good to have good people all right, on your, in your corner for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I want to take it back a little further, you know, before the COVID-19 shutdown, um, you had one of the best collegiate meets of your career. You know, that was super <laughs> exciting to watch. You were coming off this world championship Um, you know, obviously there was, uh, some personnel changing at at Alabama swimming. And so everyone was kind of like, okay, how's this going to go with, with Coley and his staff. And then, um, at SEC's Alabama has an insane showing, you know, kind of headed by you, you, uh, I think won the 50 free hundred back second, the hundred free, you know, you you had all best times. Um, take me through kind of that lat your senior season, at Alabama and coming off that world championship, what went well for you there? Yeah. So after world champs, you obviously want to keep the momentum going. So I try to do that. Um, I took my time off after worlds because that just mentally kills a person. You're exhausted after that. So I took my time after that and I immediately go back to Alabama and I got training. I was like, okay, senior season. That's the last time I get to do this. It's the last time I have to sit seven days through an SEC championships and then not be able to walk afterwards. Um, so, you know, I just make the best of it. Um, with the personnel change, there was some friction. Um, but an important part that me and all my other seniors, um, both on the men and the women's side did was we, we have to keep the team together. We have to keep them focused. Um, we're very lucky to have an incredibly strong senior class. It was me, Daniel Kober. Um, we had Kyle Moss. We, uh, Derek's brother. And then, um, we had Tristan Essary, who was, he was from Alabama. He was the core cultural of the senior class. He, you know, he was an Alabama guy, sort of like Robert Howard for our class. <laughs> um, and then on the woman's side, we had Alexis. Um, we had Ali. We had all, all the bit, like very strong personality forward people um, that, you know, if you had a problem with what we're doing at Alabama Swimming, we're, we're going to tell you. So to have that, that strong system that, the women were supporting the women, the men were supporting the men, and then both sides were supporting each other. Um, it created an, an awesome culture. And then having Coley and his staff come in, I mean, Coley's an amazing person. Reed is, uh, Reed Fugin is, uh, it's how we put this, the, this staff together with their different personalities and how they kind of intertwined was, it was amazing to me because, and even Ozzy and we had uh, Rebecca and it was awesome. Little known fact is that, uh, I had a class conflict with one of my manager information systems classes. It was um, just my, my senior capstone classes. And um, they only offered it from one to three in the afternoon, twice a week. So that's obviously smack bang in the middle of swimming training. So (laughs) Aussie's group had an earlier swim time. So I was swimming with Aussie doing 400 iron practices twice a week, leading up (laughs) like throughout my senior season. So the aerobic base was definitely there. Um, but the job of the senior class, and we made this clear between each other and with the team is, you know, we got to stick together. 
um, create a really good team environment. And we had a lot of fun with it. It was, we had an amazing SECs. Ryan White swam freaking unbelievable. Um, we had Colton Stogner, um, a guy that he was coming through the ranks. He'd never really been on an A relay. It was always like me, Bob, Lou, or Knox, you, you know, mm-hmm. or, or like the power hitters, but have him step up and anchor the relay and win it for us. Um, it was a lot of fun. And I think it, it, set, them, it set them up for the, the years following, you know, my senior year. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that is so cool to, you know, coaching changes can be hard. Like you said, they can have friction. They can be really good, obviously, but um, you know, change is always, it's always a a process and to, to have your senior class, your, all of them come together and just say, Hey, we're going to keep this team together. We're going to make it work. We're going to make the best of this situation. Obviously, you know, it, it showed at that end of the season in SEC's, uh, let's talk about 400 IM training. <laughs> so you're doing, you're doing Aussie four IM workouts twice a week. I mean, had, had you ever done something like that in college before? Uh, yeah. Um, f- uh, one of the, the funniest stories. So, uh, when it was still, uh, coach Persley and, and John T's staff, mm-hmm. uh, coming in my freshman year, I mean, I was, I was maybe like six, three, I was a skinny, I was maybe 170 pounds coming in from South Africa just because of the, the background of training we have there, but we came in and um, during the first, like the conditioning weeks, the first four to six weeks, um, every Saturday, we start off with 200 for time, 400 for time, the next week, Saturdays, then 800, 1200, 1500, then a 3000 for time. <laughs> oh my God. Consecutively like that. And I've, I've always just been able to swim longer distance just because that's how we trained in South Africa. I did crazy uh, 5k IM sets every Wednesday, 3100s was always on my plate at least once a week back home. So coming in and then when I think it was me and Daniel Kober, who was the distance guy in my senior class, and we were going head to head in the 3k for time. And everyone's like, you swim the 50 back to 53. You shouldn't be able to do this. But it's just always something I've been able to handle well. I've been in a, a very aerobically based swimmer. John T has said this. He, he, you know, you're an aerobic based swimmer. You have that explosiveness, but you have enough for the hundred. I, I hated the two hundred free. I hated the two hundred back. Um, I don't know what it was about it. I'll leave the the two back to Chris Reed and and all and uh, Ryan Murphy. They can take all the pain for that one. I kind of capped it at a hundred, but yeah. <laughs> Ozzy had some of the hardest workouts that I've ever done. Um, it was a Monday, Wednesday, and we'd be getting out and sprint group would be walking on deck and I'd walk past these sprint group guys. I'd be like, you, good luck with your easy practice today. Good luck with your easy practice. It was lots of fun. It, it was, uh, it made me a stronger swimmer for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, especially towards the beginning of that, of your season in the fall, kind of in the winter, you hear about, you know, no matter what your events are, people getting that solid aerobic base in, you know, building the blocks, and then you kind of taper it down. But what was there? Was there a workout that ever stood out to you? Um, oh, my goodness. Group? Yeah. So there was one day. Um, it was uh, it was Wednesday. It was a lactate day. Um, it was me, Carl Moss, Derek Moss, uh, Michael Burris. And then I think I don't know if Liam Bell was part of this workout. He might have been. I don't know if he was with Sprint Group that day or not. Mm-hmm. But it was a short like it was it was just 25s, but it was 60, 25 from the block on a minute, get out, walk back. So it was just a <laughs> constant 25, get back, get back. And the amount of times I've complained about that, and people say, Oh yeah, Zan's gonna talk about 60 25s. Like he hasn't <laughs> gonna talk about the 60 25s again. It was hard. And that was that's all oh, that will stick with me for the rest of my life. And Ozzy was just ready to go, ready to go, ready to go. It was awesome. <laughs> was what what stroke were they? Were they it's was it like 15 of each or you can just mix it up. Okay. You can just mix it. Yeah, Ozzy <laughs> said, you know what, just mix it up. Doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds intense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. For anyone who hasn't done something like that. Yeah. You know, like on paper that might seem like, Oh, okay. 60, 25 is on a minute, but the, the getting out seems like yeah. a real kicker. Yeah. Getting out and you, and you're trying to breathe and you're trying to walk and breathe. Your goggles are all fogging up. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's uh, so 
Okay. So, so you did, you came from an extremely aerobic background in South Africa. And I mean, when I hear about, you know, tri- like, you know, Eastern European is known for that. South Africa is known for that, you know, parts, depending on the coach, like, you know, coaches in the U S have, have that kind of mentality. Um, I mean, what made swimming for you fun during that? when you were younger, you know, what kind of kept you motivated to do those, you know, intense, super long, super aerobic kind of workouts? Yeah. Uh, at least from my perspective, coming from South Africa, it's a, it's a very sports centric country. We have mm-hmm. the, the rugby, the cricket, the soccer, the, all the Olympic, we have track field swimming. So it's everything in that country is pretty much based around sports. You build your Saturdays around a sport event. Okay. Um, and just having sort of that, I don't know, cultural motivation mm-hmm. is huge. And then growing up, you see like Ray Nethling and you see Roland and Darian and Lyndon Ferns all go through and they all go to Arizona for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. seeing them like ball out in the swimming pool, it, um, it, it, it makes it a lot easier. And then my coach, Simon Gray, he swam at University of Houston when they still had a men's team. Mm. Um, so he was a big motivation. He's like, you know what, if you get the chance to go to the U S you probably should. So that was a goal of mine. Um, and then I'm just internally, I'm just a super competitive guy. Um, you you know, to make it to the top, you have to be really competitive. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was just always easy to motivate myself for. Was, were you a practice swimmer or were you much more about racing at meets? I, I loved the racing part. I, um, my biggest weakness in swimming was like, I hate holding my breath. That's probably why I like the backstroke. (laughs) Um, So that was always a mission for me. If we're doing like a lactate sprint set with breath control, I would much rather just race in that instance. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm not sure. Um, I feel like I was a really good trainer. Um, Mm -hmm. I was going fast during training, but I just lived for the competition. So when you came to Alabama, I mean, were you recruited as a sprinter? I guess so. Yeah. I mean, John T called me and everyone knows who John T Skinner is, especially in South Africa. You know, he's the guy that was one of the first guys under 50 seconds in the hundred free. Yeah. And he called me up. He's like, yeah, we want you to Alabama. I was like, okay, I'm coming. So <laughs> it, it wasn't a very long discussion. Um, I maybe it was one or two Skype calls and I was like, okay, just send me the documents on whatever day and I'll sign them and I'll come to Alabama. I didn't, I didn't take any trips. I had never been to the U S before my first day of freshman year. <laughs> <laughs> so to have that. And I think I didn't even know John T was the sprint coach, but uh, I guess it kind of makes sense that coming off youth Commonwealth games, I won a, a bunch of the fifties at youth commies Commonwealth mm-hmm. games. Um, and I did really well in a lot of the shorter events. So I guess that's where they saw me. Mm-hmm. Um, and to have that and then John T. Skinner being the genius and the wizard he is um, he took me he did all his you know swimming float tests you have to breathe <laughs> out float and all this stuff <laughs> and then he's like yep you're a sprinter and then that my freshman year I was the freestyler on the uh, 200 meter relay we came second in that mm-hmm. and then it just kind of took off from there then I was a sprinter <laughs> bada bing bada boom (laughs) (laughs) um i mean when you got to alabama i did two i have two things so first when you got to alabama you know they had you mentioned the 200 medley relay which obviously you guys won ncaa's your junior year yeah and, and you know coming your freshman year they had just won it you know with with christian and those guys yeah um you know, what, what surprised you the most about the Alabama swimming tradition when you first arrived? I was really impressed with, um, the work effort, the work ethic everyone had. Um, everyone was super focused. Um, even when it came to academics, we had Anton McKee, the mm. world renowned breaststroker. Mm-hmm. And that guy was a classroom machine. He would stay up and then he's actually one of my inspirations. I originally wasn't a uh, management information systems, which is a uh, traditionally known. It's a really hard degree. Um, you don't have much time for anything else, but um, he was my inspiration going to that just because he laid out, these are the career options you can do. You can go become a consultant. You can go do software development. I was like, okay, okay. That's all I want. 
And he says, but just be prepared to stay up till 3 a.m. every morning and working on stuff. I was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> but this guy, he, I think he graduated with a 4.0, perfect score in the, in the MIS program and having that culture where it's like, you know, it doesn't matter if it's in the classroom or it's in a swimming pool, we're going to be competitive within our team. Yeah. So we always had, if someone made a B plus, not an A on their test, he would get ripped for it. <laughs> so, so it was always a, a sense of camaraderie, competition, having the academic side and then the swimming side. And it made it fun. It was never like a, a derogatory sort of thing. It's always mm-hmm. just fun competition. And, every, and if you're a swimmer in a, at the collegiate level, you love for that sort of stuff. So, And yeah, we, we, we just kind of geeked out. We had a lot of engineers on the team, so they would geek out with their majors. And we had a lot of computer science and all that. So it's it just a lot of fun. That sounds like a lot of fun. I, yeah. That's, uh, you know, not necessarily a side of college swimming. You always get to hear a ton about, but that's, that's really cool that, you know, even that's part of the competition, but in a fun way. Yeah. Um, so then, so my second question is you get to Alabama, you're recruited by John T and, and you, you tipped on it a little bit, but, um, yeah, I mean, tell me about what, what surprised you about him the most, you know, he, you mentioned the floating test. He's like, okay, you're a sprinter, but, um, you know, I've, John T is like one of the most fascinating people in swimming. You sit down and have a conversation with him and you'll like, every time I talk to him, my mind is just blown. I'm like, this is a revolutionary. Um, <laughs> what surprised you about working with him the most that first season? The way he articulated himself. So he had his ideas and he mm-hmm. knew what his ideas were, but obviously to get that out and to make a bunch of college swimmers understand that, uh, is a different a different task on its own. So to have him just articulate it the way he did, and he was very relatable with each and every swimmer. So each and each and every one of his swimmers is different, but um, I'm convinced he has a notepad with the name of every swimmer and how to handle (laughs) them. I'm convinced. (laughs) And he just knows how to handle a college swimmer um, with like with me, I have a certain way. I, if you want to get the best out of me, you got to be intense. You got to tell me what I have to do. You got to tell me what I did wrong and just be straight with me. But with some other swimmers, you have to give them a little bit of positive reinforcement before you ease into how they can improve the next race. Yep. Um, and he had the perfect balance with that. And then he articulated his ideas with that. I'll never forget the day. So Wednesdays, we called it movie day. He'd wheel out. The, the TV and then for the first hour of a two hour practice, he go over skills, turns, starts. Um, he's hydroplaning freestyle that mm-hmm. he talks about. And it was that I was like, John, we're missing an hour of training. We can be working right now. He's <laughs> like this, you'll appreciate this. And I think it really helped a lot. He spent a lot of time working on my underwater kicking. I was a really weak underwater kicker coming mm-hmm. into college um, cause I'd never done short course yards or meters for that sake. Um, and just the time and effort he put into each and every one of his swimmers is what amazed me most. And then, you know, he has all these ideas and put a stick between your arms and do that and do this. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I can work with it. He's a, like a scientific, he engages the mental aspect of swimming. So it's not always just rum and drum, just do 10 fifties max, da, 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 these are your times kind of focus on stuff. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, he was, he was a fatherly figure for me coming into the U.S. I mean, for the first three years, we're both South African boys. Whenever we walked in, the receptionist says, oh, there's my South African boys. Uh, like, <laughs> so it was always just nice to have that connection. And then um, I think each swimmer will give you a different story of how John T has impacted their lives. And, you know, it, it'll stick. I still get in contact with him. I think he's more of a golfer now than he is anything <laughs> else. <laughs> So to even have conversations, he says he spends hours watching, analyzing his golf swing. You know what, John T, you were spending hours analyzing swimming. I think it's time to change. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, needs, he needs a new challenge. He's mastered swimming. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, that's so cool to hear. And it's, uh, that's cool that you were able to come over, get that experience. So, you know, it obviously hasn't been very long, but I'm guessing you've had a little time to just kind of reflect, look back on your career and, and, you know, what, what sticks out to you um, the, the most in terms of just when you look back and you're like, okay, this was cool. This was cool. I'll never forget that. Yeah. It's uh, it's the whole swimming experience, you know, looking back um, 
Robert Howard was a major part of my college career growing up or uh, coming through the college system. Um, he was always there. Uh, we were always on the same relays. We swam the same events until my sophomore, junior year when I started pivoting towards backstroke away from freestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and then he exploded. You know, he had the most perfect freestyle stroke out of anyone I've ever seen. Um, so it was awesome to like make those relationships. Uh, I have friends that were on the swim team that are consultants at like Bain and Company, McKinsey. I had friends at Goldman. I have friends from Russia, um, from all four corners of the world. Um, it's always awesome to make those relationships. Um, the opportunity to get to do an academic, to pursue an academic career outside of the pool is, is because coming from South Africa, you don't get that opportunity. You're either a sportsman or you go to university. You can't do both at the same time. So to have that opportunity was because it's something I wanted to do. Um, that was amazing. And then obviously my junior season, we won the, the, the relay that was incredible. And then that just led into a whole, I mean, that was the start of the craziest year of my life where I was just, I, I couldn't do anything wrong in the 50 back. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think just the whole experience is just really fun making those friendships. So we, all the swimming guys are still in the group. Uh, we're texting each other and, you know, it's, it's friendships that you'll never, ever lose. And I think that's the important part that you have to look back on because uh, next year at the next world champs, there's going to be another 50 back world champ. And then two years after that, there's going to be another 50 back. And then you're eventually going to, that's going to be forgotten about. Um, but, you know, the friendships you make and the people that were there to experience it with you, they'll never forget that. And it's always a talking point. Um, for that and life isn't all swimming there is other things that you can achieve in life um it's something i struggled to see i was like okay this is swimming this is who i am um and it, it i struggled mentally with that trying to pivot away from that you know i'm a swimmer i'm an athlete i'm nothing else but that um but to kind of go out of that it's like okay i kind of i was good at the stuff i did academically i had made these awesome friendships and now I really enjoying the work I'm doing for the bank right now. Um, it just, there's a whole, a whole array of things that I could probably spend an hour blabbering on about jaunty esque. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really cool. And I gotta, I gotta ask about that world championship just because you, because you were just talking about it. I, I'm curious, you know, who were, when you look back on that, who are the people that you got to share that, you know, 2019 worlds and, and, you know, 50 back world championship with. I think everyone leading uh, the summer leading into that Coley had just come in. Mm -hmm. It was like a sort of purgatory mm -hmm. area. There was like some jaunty, some Coley that were trying to yeah. shift over and change management and whatnot. Um, Ryan held and Santo Condorelli. I had a couple training sessions with them, which was, amazing because santo takes swimming to a whole different level <laughs> and just being around that guy um same with ryan held is incredible the way you can see how they've achieved the success they have mm -hmm. um then having robert howard who he, he was first going to uh, world university games with me um he was on that relay with where dean farris and zach apple <laughs> were just you know they could have won worlds for right, that yeah, time they just blew up <laughs> yeah and then um, that was fun. And then uh, after WUGS, all the, uh, because I knew a lot of the American swimmers and the South African swimmers, I mean, so South Africans are just fun in general. So we had all the US always tagging along <laughs> with the South Africans. Weirdest combination <laughs> under the sun. But that was always fun. Um, and then at obviously to spend it with, um, I had a hometown friend make the national team to Worlds with me, Eben Foster. He swam at Pitt, the University of Pittsburgh. Hmm. Um, and he was on the national team and we were having lunch because the 50 back is obviously on the last day. So I'd wait. I was doing meat warm up every day of that, <laughs> that meat until the 50 back. That's, uh, uh, that's funny. So to have him there was, was awesome because he would keep me focused. He'd be like, Hey, this is what you got to do. He's just no pressure. He'd make a joke, crack a joke. Mm -hmm. um, and we had our little thing before worlds and then to celebrate with the South African team afterwards. Um, with, with, with Chad DeClo and all those guys. Um, if Chad hadn't been injured, I think he would have done a lot better than what 
than what he did. But you see, and that helped a lot. You know, I knew that um, and everyone found out afterwards that he had to get surgery mm -hmm. um, and to do an explosive start of the blocks and then do it like a 200 fly or 100 fly with uh, a groin problem. I was like, geez, well, that gave me a lot of motivation. You know, if you can do it with that, I can probably get a gold medal if I'm healthy, I'm rested and everything. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just a whole accumulation of things where it's just amazing to have the people along the way. And I still chat daily to Eben and our other friend. He swam D2 at the University of Bridgeport in Connecticut. He's also oh, nice. with the, the three musketeers from our hometown. Um, so it's just awesome. And to be able to spend those times, is, I'll never forget. Eben told me, if you win the 50 back, you got to go crazy. you got to celebrate. you got to scream. <laughs> And then he says, you got to get in the block and point at us. So I, that's what I did. Uh, I don't think some, some people weren't happy that I got into the blocks. They're like, oh, it's, it's a 50 back. It's not an Olympic event. Like, calm down. But it's just something that, you know. <laughs> Come on. I'm, yeah, I'm I'm champion. Like, yeah, it's like if, you, if I'm going to score the winning touchdown in the Super Bowl, I'm going to spike the ball. I'm going to point <laughs> yeah. my teammates and stuff like that. If you scored the winning goal in the Champions League, you're going to go friggin' nuts. It was just awesome, you know, I just have those moments and opportunities to celebrate with teammates and it's one big celebration. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's something that will be with me forever, even as I now go through the corporate world and try and achieve my goals uh, in, in that sphere of life. So, to, to, I mean, that was, that was a great story and that, that's a good wrapping up point. Um, I mean, I got to ask, are you, you know, with, especially we've seen the veterans in South Africa, you know, maybe step away for a while and then come back to, to, and, and keep swimming. Roland Schumann still swimming. I'm pretty <laughs> sure he's still like putting up, you know, world top times. I mean, do you, could you ever see yourself coming back in some capacity to swimming? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I have my sights set on um, the business world now. It's something that I've, I grew up wanting to do. I always said, I'm going to grow up. I'm going to be a CEO. I was never going to be a sports person. I was going to, you know, I'm going to wear a suit every day. Mm -hmm. I ended up wearing a different suit every day, <laughs> but, but it, it, that, that was always a goal of mine growing up. Um, and I'm really excited to start that journey. It's like, it's like attending your first training when you're yeah. nine or 10 years old and you're just starting out and you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing or what I'm doing here, but I know that if I work hard enough, I can reach the top. And yeah, I don't know. Swimming was awesome while it lasted. Um, it gets tough as you get the higher the levels you go. People get more intense. Um, they aren't as happy if they're losing. They're, you know, you, you know it, it <laughs> yeah. kind of begins to get that vibe. And I'm guilty of this. I was the most upset person if I got second. Um, but yeah, I do have my sights set on a whole different set of goals now that I'm done with swimming. And one thing that I do want to do is help swimming um, from a different aspect. I gave, I gave my whole life to swimming on the competitive side in the swimming pool. I think now as swimming is making that transition over to more of a, um, more into the boardroom around actual suits rather than <laughs> swimming pool suits. Um, I think it's a very interesting time with swimming now. The ISL had a very successful, second season which i'm very sad i couldn't be a part of because i, I think maxime rooney um ryan murphy and then uh, me and ryan murphy we he, we he instagram messaged me he's like bro when's your possible coming we could kill these skins i was like i know bro Dude. We, could, we could kill this <laughs> been <out>. skin <laughs> and then uh yeah i think it's something's in a very interesting position right now where they're trying to commercialize the sport which you need yeah, I mean, you, uh, you're not going to have swimmers wanting to put their bodies on the line for 18 years. Same with football players. Um, although they do take a little bit harder hits, um, your shoulders still, you can pick up an injury um, and that can be the end of your swimming career. Uh, same as with a concussion in football. If you get a concussion, that can be the end of your career. But to, in order to commercialize those efforts, um, it's a very interesting time. And hopefully by the time where I can actually make a difference, um, through my business career or through my banking career, I guess. Um, there are definitely other ways that I'll be able to help, um, be it commercialize a team or through funding and, or helping someone that is in my position, that, that is in the position I was, you know, just help, help out a swimmer or something like that. Um, 
I'll forever be involved with swimming. It's just, it's just the way it is. It's, it's part of my DNA. Um, but I'll, I'll definitely be keeping a close eye on the commercialization of swimming and, and um, how that moves forward. Because I think the ISL is going to be a raging success, especially with the Olympics. It's going to bring a lot of eyes to the sport of swimming or Olympic sports in general. I think it can benefit the season three if they can get it going, if they can get the appropriate TV deals and um, the locations open up with the vaccine and everything. I think it would be very interesting to see um, where things could lead in the future. Agreed. Yeah, I think I think the commercialization, like you said, of swimming is is kind of the biggest and most exciting overarching story in uh, in swimming's narrative right now. So I'm I'm with you. I'm excited to see where it goes, and it's cool to hear that you will. You know, I, I think if you're a part of the swimming family, the swimming community, you never really leave. You just you put on a different suit, like you said. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um well zane i appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk with me it's been you've you got some great stories and it's it's been great hearing them any parting thoughts before we sign off uh no i just all the swimmers there keep working hard um enjoy your college years there's only four of them it feels like one um and just have fun doing it you know that's what what more could you ask for in life than happiness You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.